Um, would anyone be willing to open us in prayer? Jesus, our Lord, we thank you for this day, our Lord Father. We thank you for this new week, our Lord God. Jesus, as we are going to start our classes, our Lord Father, Holy Spirit God, we ask you, O Lord Father, to be present, O Lord Father. Give us your guidance, give us your wisdom, O Lord Father, to learn, O Lord Father, and uh, to be equipped with everything that you are teaching and that you are imparting into our lives, O Lord Father. Help us, O Lord Father, not to be distracted. We just surrender our minds, our thoughts into your hands, O Lord Father God. You come and you take control over our lives. In Jesus' mighty precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, since we have the presentations today as well, maybe we uh, won't go into the recap for last week. We'll just continue uh, from where we stopped. So uh, we stopped with Constantine coming into power and uh, there being a sudden shift in the way the church was viewed. Uh, so before then, um, Christians were persecuted and uh, those who were coming into the church were coming in with a lot of struggle. Uh, but now what happened was the church was actually favored by the government. And so people wanted to come into the church because there were benefits for them as they were coming in. Uh, so there was uh, actually both social and political benefit because you were aligning yourself with uh, what the emperor himself was um, was supporting, right? So people started coming into the church. All of the Roman citizens started um, joining the church in large numbers. But the problem now was that uh, the, the strength of their belief was not great because they were not really experiencing Christ or uh, believing the gospel and coming in. They were just uh, coming in because they knew uh, that there was benefit to them joining the church. And so what happens then is there needs to be uh, more discipleship happening within the church because people don't have the kind of teaching they had before they joined the church before. Uh, now they were just coming in and then once they joined the church, they had to start understanding uh, what it meant to be a Christian. Um, so we also see that um, the churches before had were meeting in houses and were meeting in smaller numbers. But now there were actual buildings that were being made for the church to meet in. And a lot of the old pagan temples were then converted to uh, church buildings for the congregation to meet in for services. Uh, so it was quite a big shift in uh, the way uh, Christians experience their faith, but as well as what the church was. The church completely changed through this time. Uh, so around this time, uh, there came a question about the divinity and humanity of Jesus. Uh, so people were still trying to understand all of these things, like how is Jesus divine? How is he also human? Uh, how does he relate to the Father? Are they the same person? Are they two people? Uh, all of these different things. And so there was someone named uh, Arius who was an elder in Alexandria in Egypt. And he um, talked about Jesus' divinity and how he's related to the Father, but his uh, explanation for that relationship was not something that the church accepted. Uh, so he was taken out of the church, and um, and then it started from there to become a big debate about how is uh, how is Jesus related to the Father. Uh, another person in 323 AD, so that uh, happened in 318 AD, where Arius uh, starts to talk about uh, that Jesus and the Father. And then 323 AD is uh, the father of church history, Bishop Eusebius. So uh, now that uh, 
um, now that there was so much support from the outside, there was a lot more scholarship that started to happen in the church. So uh, Eusebius is one example of that. So he was very learned in scripture itself. And so he wrote a lot of what we know of the church, of the early church. So it's because of his records of the early church that we can talk about church history. Uh, he records... Um, a lot of different things about the church and how the church progressed under uh, Constantine's leadership. Uh, but he was also influenced by Constantine because uh, Constantine was a supporter of the church. The way he looked at Constantine's role within the church was also influenced by that. Um, so we have here a list of different things that he wrote. I won't go into it, but uh, a lot of texts, a lot of books about um, what was happening in the church at that time. Uh, sorry, just go back. So uh, 325 AD was the first uh, official council of the churches. So we see in um, Jerusalem, there was a council of the leaders in Jerusalem, right? In Acts 15, which we read about, uh, where um, Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem to ask about uh, whether the Gentiles need to be circumcised. And so they go to the council of leaders in Jerusalem. But this is the first council that means across church leaders from different places. And this happens because Constantine is, he's basically sponsoring all of these leaders coming in to meet in this place. So he's covering all of their costs, making it possible for them to come in. It's the first time all of these church leaders from all over the place get to meet face to face. All this time, it's more like there's letters, they know of each other, there is some correspondence. The first time they're all meeting face to face. And uh, one of the major things they talk about is the person and nature of Christ. So that Arian controversy, controversy that we talked about is something that becomes a big topic that is debated in this council. Um, now, uh, Constantine was also in a, a battle over the empire at that time, and he had just fought a battle and won it. So he was very particular about trying to keep the unity within the empire. Uh, so his calling for this council was to encourage the churches to be unified so that there wouldn't be any split within the empire because of the church. Uh, so it, it was both a political as well as a... Uh, it was sort of like a political move uh, on his part. Right? So they all came together and um, they are basically talking about, okay, who is, how is Jesus related to the Father? Is he of the same, does he share uh, unity with the Father in a way that there are only one person or are there two different people? And then if there are two different people, how do they relate to each other? So it's all of the major theologies that support our faith now in Christ as a church, but some things that we've never had to question or think about because all of these battles have already been fought uh, early on. So uh, this was a huge debate. Uh, a lot of these theological questions became huge debates uh, within the church early on. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my notes. Um, and uh, uh, it was based on these things that then we established the doctrine of the Trinity and all of that. Um, so it was held in Nicaea. I think I have that on the map. I'll just share it. Uh, yeah, so 325 AD is where the Council of Nicaea met, and that's right here. Okay, um, so very close to Constantinople. Um, and this is where all of the major decisions were made by the church leaders. 
So even though in this council they met and they uh, condemned what Aries was teaching, uh, this still continued to be something that was debated within the church. Uh, who is Jesus? Uh, and how do we understand the nature of Jesus? It was only in 381, which is uh, like 55, 56 years later, that they fully established the nature of Jesus. Like, what is the doctrine of the church? What do we believe about the nature of Jesus? Uh, was at the next council, which is the Council of Constantinople in 381. Uh, another thing that was approved in this Council of Nicaea was the role of patriarchs, which were like bishops of all of the different regions in the Roman Empire. So each bishop would um, would kind of oversee churches in a specific province. Uh, and so they started to become very, very powerful because the church was growing and the church was growing under Constantine's uh, kind of support. Uh, was becoming richer and richer, getting more property, all of that. And so finally, we see that the Bishop of Rome is the one who becomes the Pope over all of the, the whole church. Um, we also see that patriarchs continue to be a role that the Eastern Orthodox Church. So eventually, there was a split within the church between the East and West. And the West is what uh, is comprised of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but the Eastern side became the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so uh, we continue to see patriarchs even till today in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, in AD 330, uh, Constantine moved. So in the same map, you can see where Constantinople is, right? Uh, Constantinople is right here. So Constantine moved the uh, capital of uh, the Roman Empire from Rome, from here to Constantinople. So he established a new city, uh, called it Constantinople, and this became the uh, capital city. So this was also a political move, uh, so that a lot of the old people who had power who lived in the Rome in Rome uh, kind of lost some of their power because the new capital had been established in another place. Um, and so although Rome lost its power from a political standpoint, the church in Rome continued to be very powerful. And that's why we see the Pope coming from there, leading from there. Um, or do I have that? Yeah, so it moves right here to Constantinople. Um, 361 to 363, there is another emperor called Julian, and he opposes what Constantine was doing. So Julian is actually a nephew of Constantine, uh, and he is not in favor of Christianity in the empire. And so he tries to reestablish paganism, but uh, he's not able to, he doesn't succeed in doing that. Uh, 367 is when the New Testament, so what all books would be included in the New Testament, are given some recognition. So all of these, like we talked about earlier, all of these letters were already being passed around the churches. They were already recognized as authoritative for the Christian life. But uh, there's a letter that Athanasius wrote in 367. And uh, later on, some councils that met recognize that these are the books that we're going to include in the New Testament. And so that was called the canon of the New Testament, all the books that were included. Um, so it was not that they created new scriptures, but what already was being circulated was recognized as these are going to be authoritative for the church. Uh, in 381 uh, was when Christianity became the official religion of the state. So, so far, it was only Constantine who had said, OK, we will accept this as one of the religions within the uh, empire. And actually, um, at that time, the emperor was viewed as the head of the, uh, of the pagan religion there. So Constantine, even though he had done that, continued to be the head of the pagan religion. So it was a very 
while he was supporting Christians, he had not fully, he had not become a Christian himself. It was only on his deathbed that he got baptized. So uh, this is when the first time where Christianity becomes a religion of the state of the Roman Empire. Uh, and 381 is where this Council of Constantinople is held. And this is where that um, controversy about Jesus' nature and the person of Jesus is fully settled for the church in 381. Uh, although Arianism continues, so there are people who follow that, but from the church leadership perspective, uh, passing on to this is what the church believes, uh, it's established at this council. Okay, sorry, my... Okay, yeah. Yeah, so in this council is where the divinity and humanity, understanding both of that, those aspects of Jesus uh, is accepted here. 384 is uh, where Jerome translates the Bible into Latin. So uh, it had been previously translated in AD 150, but they had used the Greek Septuagint that time to, transfer, uh, to translate it. But this time Jerome uses the original Hebrew and uh, the translation into Latin is done uh, as he's commissioned by the Pope at that time. 386, uh, there's someone named Augustine. Has anyone heard of Augustine? Yes? Okay, so uh, there's a reason why we've heard of him, right? Because he did uh, contributed a great deal to the church's theology. And um, so he comes to faith in 386 and becomes one of the most, yes, one of the most important theologians in church history, even quoted till today. Uh, AD 393 is the Council of Hippo. So there's another council where the church leaders meet. And this is where they finally close the canon of scripture. So they say that uh, no more books will be added. We finally defined that these are all the books that are going to be there in the New Testament. Uh, and this is in agreement with what they had already agreed before. But this is just where they say that we are finally going to uh, agree on this. And 397 at the Council of Carthage, they closed that canon of scripture. AD 400 um, is where the old Syriac New Testament was written. So actually in the second century, there was a Syriac, translation of the Bible. It's called the Peshitta. And uh, that was um, used because that was a common language. People spoke Syriac in trade, in international relations, communication, Syriac was used. So that translation actually contributed to the spread of Christianity because most people knew Syriac. So even though the Old Testament was in Hebrew. Lots of Jews didn't understand Hebrew because uh, they had been under Greek leadership, right? So Greek had become the common language. Similarly, for those who were in Syria, Syriac was the common language. So they couldn't understand their own scriptures in Hebrew, which is why the Bible became uh, was translated into Syriac, so that people could understand it and so that Christianity could be could easily spread to other places um, in a language that people understood. Okay, so uh, sadly, by the end of this century uh, is where the church that was being persecuted now starts to persecute others uh, because there is so much power within the church, there's so much political power within the church. Uh, that it starts to uh, oppress or uh, come against anyone who doesn't come into agreement with the church, whether it's a theological agreement or submission to uh, the leaders of the church, all of those things. Uh, they start to go against it, and then we read about the crusades, all of those things. So the this church that was the weak church, the church that was suffering, now starts to do all of that too other people it starts to cause suffering to other people and so we go into the middle ages or the dark ages because um, what we see as a powerful move of god in the start like 
in the early church, where God was moving in power, where there was uh, people coming to faith because they were experiencing the Holy Spirit, right? It was not for any, uh, any other motives. In fact, they were entering into this faith knowing that they would suffer for it. Um, so where there was so much conviction, so much power of the Holy Spirit, uh, all of that suddenly becomes completely disappears from the church and it becomes very institutionalized. So um, there is a lot of hierarchy, there's a lot of power with the leaders, the lay people don't even have scripture. Like there's, uh, So people in the church couldn't read the scripture for themselves. Um, there's a lot of rituals that are prescribed by the church that are not even in scripture. Um, there's um, there's uh, political power in the church. So they are influencing the politics of that day because there's so much authority given to the church leaders. And so there's all of that corruption within the church. There's a lot of money in the church. So all of these things uh, kind of take the church away from why we truly exist. Um, we we'll see lots of uh, beliefs that came into the church that were uh, completely not from scripture. So there was praying to the saints, uh, belief in purgatory, which is like uh, for someone who believed in Jesus, but was not fully sanctified. Uh, when they die, they go to a place where they have to pay for their sins before they can go into heaven. So this was one of the teachings of the church. Uh, another was indulgences. So that was a payment of money to pay for your sins, to prove that you are um, that you are repentant for your sins, and to uh, kind of as a way to safeguard yourself from going into purgatory. So instead of going into purgatory, you pay this thing and your sins will be absolved by the church leaders. Um, yeah, then there was worship of relics. So uh, things that uh, body parts or pieces of cloth or things like that that were related to saints within the church who had died started to be put inside the church and people would worship those things. So all of these things came into the church and um, we had also talked about the monks before. Uh, so the monks were connected to the church and the mon monastic movement also was affected because it continued to be a part of the church. So uh, the monks would function under the leading of the Pope. So in 596, that's almost 100 years later, there was the first monk who was also a Pope, that's Gregory the Great. Okay, and uh, he sends a team of missionaries out under the leadership of someone named Augustine, who is not the same Augustine we talked about earlier. Um, so they go to England with the gospel, and uh, the gospel had already been introduced in England, but they're going back with the objective of reaching them for the gospel, like taking the gospel back to them. And uh, about 10,000 people are baptized within that year. So I'll just. It also early being sent from Rome. Yes. Yeah. So the Pope himself. So this uh, monk, Gregory, was also the Pope at the same time. So he sends them uh, to establish the church. So in this time, it was a little bit because the church was involved in politics. Even if they were doing this kind of work, it was. Uh, there was political motive also behind it because with the spread of uh, Christianity was also the spread of the church's uh, influence, right? So the church could still influence England because the Pope was ruling over all the church. Okay, so... Um, what's that, sorry? So this is England, and uh, here on the left, where is my, can't see my mouse, here, yeah, yeah, on the left, the English Channel is in between here, and Canterbury is where they go. So they go to Canterbury and they uh, begin to do their missions work.
Okay, so, um, and then in AD 635 is when we see uh, the first Christian missionaries going out. Um, so, from Asia Minor and Persia, there are missionaries who go into China. Now, China, it's believed that uh, the Apostle Thomas also went to China when he came to India. Uh, but this is where the missionaries are sent out uh, to China. And um, so they, these people were called Nestorian monks. They were actually from the eastern side of the church. So Rome and all was the western side of the church. The Nestorian monks were from the eastern side. So they go to, um, they go to China. So they're from Asia Minor and from Persia. They go to China with the gospel. Uh, yeah, 15, oh, so, sorry, 1150 to 1270, um, there's a merchant named Peter Waldo, and he is from southern France. So he reads uh, Matthew 10, 5 to 13, if someone wants to read that for us. Matthew 10, 5 to 13. And verse 5 to 15. 5 to 13. Okay. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his foot. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Okay, so he read this and he was inspired by this, uh, by Jesus' instructions for them to uh, go out without taking any um, anything with them, but to fully depend on the people who they were preaching to, to support them. And so uh, inspired by this, he starts to um, encourage the church to return to the teaching of scripture. Uh, and then he also rejects the idea of purgatory and uh, the infallibility of the church. So the infallibility of the church was to say whatever the church says is uh, authoritative and there is no error. So whatever the church institutes is correct and you should not oppose it. Um, and then uh, he also said that Christian laypersons could preach. Uh, selling one's goods and giving to the poor were acts of consecration. So encouraging uh, encouraging sacrifice and poverty uh, for the sake of preaching the gospel. So uh, this was where, so even in this time, we see there are glimpses of people uh, starting to uh, recognize that there is something in the church that needs, that has gone away from scripture. So even before the Reformation, we see a few people who uh, start to address these things. Um, Okay, I think we just have a few minutes, so maybe we can go into Nina's presentation. Uh, Nina, you can uh, go ahead. Okay. Fine. I think we'll be going kind of past where we are right now. Uh huh. Okay. But uh, but but since you're prepared to share today, we'll just go ahead. 
All right. No, uh, come again. You said that we will go fast in the sense of what we are doing in the lesson. Uh, yes, because we haven't yet reached. Uh, you're presenting on William Tyndale, right? That's right. That's so right. we haven't yet reached um, William Tyndale on our as we are uh -huh. going through church history. But okay. uh, since you're prepared to share today, we'll just go ahead and have your presentation. No, it's okay. I mean, I can, I could wait, like whenever it would be the right time. I have no issues. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm prepared, so but there is no issue. We then can, we, we can do it. probably yeah. go into tomorrow. Is that okay? Is tomorrow yeah. okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Fine. No problem. Okay. Sure. Uh, Thank sure. you. Not at all. No one uh, chose John Wycliffe, right, for presentation? I don't think anyone. Yes, so William Tyndale is a bit later. So uh, then we'll just continue where we are. <laughs> okay, so we'll see. Uh, we'll just look at whether y'all can do it tomorrow. I'll check, depending on how much we have to cover. Okay. So we'll continue then. Um, so 1200, the Bible is now available in 22 different languages. Okay, so um, even though officially uh, from the church, uh, the Latin Bible was being used, and which is why the uh, lay people didn't have access to the Bible. Um, there were translations that had been made. And so these uh, Bibles were available. In 1266, um, there is in Mongolia uh, a leader there who um, Sends, um, if you'll have heard of Marco Polo. So Marco Polo, uh, his father and uncle were uh, merchants who were trading uh, from Venice. They were trading in Mongolia. And so uh, they would travel through the Silk Road, right? That was the uh, route for trade. They traveled from Venice uh, to their, uh, to China trading. And so they were, they come across this Mongolian leader who sent them back to uh, Europe and asked the Pope that to send 100 Christian missionaries uh, to Mongolia. But only two people actually respond to that invitation. And on the way, as they're returning, one of them dies on the way to Mongolia. So only one person actually goes back. Um, in 1382, uh, John Wycliffe, um, does the English translation of the Bible. Uh, now, John Wycliffe was born in Yorkshire. I don't know if I have that on the presentation. No, I don't. OK. Um, OK, so he was uh, born in Yorkshire in England around uh, 1324. He studied at Oxford University. So it's like a lot of scholarly work was done in this time. Um, he received his doctorate in theology. Um, and although he lived almost 200 years before the Reformation, uh, his teachings and his beliefs were very close to what the reformers taught, uh, to what Luther, Calvin, and other reformers taught. Uh, so because he's someone who taught so early on, uh, on these things, he's called as the morning star of the Reformation. Uh, it started kind of with the things he was talking about. Uh, so some of the things he talked about was that uh, every Christian has the right to know the Bible. Uh, so it was not only uh, a right that the priests had um, to teach and to explain what scripture said, um, that, um, that the Bible within scripture, we can see that Christ alone is sufficient for uh, salvation. We don't need anything in addition to that. Uh, and then... They didn't need, you didn't need pilgrimages, you didn't need works, you didn't need mass to be saved. Okay, Christ alone was sufficient. Uh, so Wycliffe translated the Bible to English um, using Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And um, 
So Jerome was the one who translated from Hebrew to Latin. Okay, so he used the original language to translate to Latin, whereas the previous Latin translations had used the Greek Septuagint. Uh, so now uh, Wycliffe uses the Latin translation because Latin was well known, right? So even if they didn't know Hebrew, or they didn't know Greek, they could still use the Latin to translate to other languages. So he uses that and translates to English. Um, but after Wycliffe's death, there were people following him, known as the Lollards. And uh, they are uh, people who are kind of seen as the people who uh, were before the Reformation, but were kind of started that work of the Reformation. Um, 1415, there's someone named John Huss. Um, I'll just share my screen as well, sorry. Okay, so uh, John Haas was born in a country called Bohemia, which is now Czechoslovakia. Um, and he was born to poor parents, so uh, they were peasants. Uh, so to get out of poverty, he trained to become a priest. Uh, so he got his master's degree uh, in Prague. Okay, um, you can see Prague there on the map as well. So uh, he studied there, and um, he was. He later on became a professor of theology. He was ordained to, be, uh, and he became a priest. He then got a bachelor's degree in theology, uh, and he was the preacher at uh, the church called Bethlehem Chapel, which was one of the most influential churches in that region of Prague. Um, so he reads the teachings of John Cliff and some of his writings and is inspired by that. And uh, he starts to kind of preach some of that. Uh, so uh, that the church is not supreme, uh, the church is supreme, not the Pope. Uh, and then he recognizes the need for reformation uh, to remove corruption uh, from within the church, to remo remove the abuse of the church uh, over the people who are in the church. Um, he believed that each person should have a Bible in their own language. Uh, and he preached, before Luther could preach it, he preached about justification by faith, uh, supreme authority of scripture. And because he starts to preach all of this in a very influential church, obviously this then goes up to the leaders of the church. And they are very angry about it. Uh, they tell him to stop preaching. He doesn't stop preaching. And so he's excommunicated from the church, which means he's uh, sent out of the church. Um, and he was finally handed over to the government so uh, to be burnt to death in July 6th, 1415. So this is how we see that there was so much power right um, within the church. Uh, 1429, uh, has anyone watched Joan of Arc, the movie? Sorry? John McCliffe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Sorry, if someone saying anything? No. Okay. Okay. So, um, Joan of Arc was from France, and she again was from, uh, so she was a peasant girl, uh, and she saw heavenly beings. So, she saw visions uh, with heavenly beings. She heard voices, and uh, what her understanding of all of those experiences was that uh, God wanted her to deliver France from the English domination there over France. Uh, so she 
went against the English uh, rulers in a place called Orlean, uh, and she won that battle and uh, established another French ruler in place to rule the uh, rule France. Um, but eventually she was captured by the English and that French ruler kind of distanced himself from her because now she was uh, someone who was uh, in prison, right? So uh, with that, he, he didn't come to her aid. And the English authorities then uh, bring charges of witchcraft against her. And uh, she is also put to death. But during her, uh, while they're putting her to death, she holds a crucifix in her hand. and. Throughout that time, she is calling on the name of Jesus uh, till she dies. So there is a movie. I've not watched it. I'm not sure how close it is to history, but uh, there is a movie, Joan of Arc. OK, so any questions uh, or anything you all want to share until now? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's uh, also sad to see some of the decline in the church when you read uh, all of the amazing things that were happening and then how a lot of uh, politics, a lot of corruption comes into the church. Um, so that is also something for us to be aware of, right? Um, be careful against that. Yeah. Maybe now we are just speaking uh, about them. But then in the church, on, or the, out of the church, uh, they would have spoke very badly about them. Yeah. Right? So once you were taken out of the church, it was like you'd lost... Um, it was almost like you were you had become nothing you were, because the church was the only like body of christ that there was right because all of the churches came under that one uh leader so if you're not in that then there's no other church that you can go join uh, there's no other place so uh, sometimes you see that the church also uh, adopted wrong teaching and if someone was trying to bring in right teaching like we'll see with Luther and all of them, uh, they were put out of the church, even though finally later on the church accepted that teaching. Uh, Ma'am, do you think like this, the act what is what's happened in these days, like how they are doing, like uh, sending out people from the church, it's it seemed like, uh, see, uh, this low caste people, they were just... Uh, not allowing them to come to temples. Mm. So that's what happened then and now in India. I mm. mean, it's yeah. actually the same. Like if we see in this perspective, mm -hmm. it's same, right? The exclusion of some people. Here, the exclusion was based on if you're willing to submit to the, the leadership's authority, right? The Pope's authority. If you're willing to accept everything that they're saying, then you're welcome into the church. But if you challenge anything they say, then uh, then you'll be sent out. So, yeah. So it's because there was so much power and they were... Uh, maybe it came initially, it was to protect what... Uh, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Protection of power and authority. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we see also in the crusade, there was so much um, because uh, the church, I mean, because uh, those political places were growing, the they were taking religion there, but they were religion was used also as a way to like uh, bring death to people. Like so, the religion and politics were like hand in hand. Yeah. 
so there's no difference. So Christianity was being taken, but there was also this thing of getting, uh, getting power. And so it's a little confusing of like, what are the methods we are using? Are we going in just preaching the gospel? Or are we using that kind of political power to take the gospel in? Yeah. Huh. Uh, I think a lot of things have changed. Uh, definitely, that political power doesn't exist as much. Um, but there is still like a lot of authority with the Pope and um, that the practices of purgatory, I mean, the belief in purgatory, uh, indulgences, I think, has changed a bit. But there is still like you confess your sins and you um, like the father there uh, will kind of hear your sins and declare, pronounce forgiveness and all of those things. So, yeah. And also, like, I would say, like, um, like all these people, they went to all the games, they went to our Starbucks, which we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it took a lot to stand up to the church because they had so much power. So when you're going against them, you're just one person going against such a big institution. Uh, it was a lot of courage on their part. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you, uh, all of you online for joining as well. We'll see you tomorrow.